The hydrogen atom can be solved exactly, but its functions are sometimes difficult to use as a basis when we're treating multi-electron atoms, and they also have limited accuracy in that case. Now, let me remind you that uh, the wave functions that we had for the hydrogen atom uh, were indexed by three quantum numbers, n, l, and m, and we could write them basically as a normalization constant times a part that was dependent upon r, uh, the distance of the electron from the nucleus. It was r to the l, e to the minus r over n a0. And then there was a part that was dependent upon something called Laguerre polynomials, which were indexed by n and l as follows. And they had as their arguments this function of r, basically 2r over n a0. And then the angular part of the wave functions for the hydrogen atom were given by the spherical harmonics. And these are actually you know, a pretty good set of uh, functions for us to use. But this is where the angular part is. It's all in the spherical harmonics. Now, this part of the wave function that depends upon the radial distance of the electron from the nucleus uh, is uh, well formulated. It's exact. Um, and it gives rise to the possibility of radial nodes, especially in the Laguerre polynomials. So we can have radial nodes given the way the hydrogen atom orbitals are, are defined here. But uh, this is, generally speaking, not an easy set of functions to, uh, to work with, and we want to have something that's going to be a little bit more... Um, a little bit more easy to use mathematically and uh, still has same, uh, some of the same accuracy. So what we do instead is we define, uh, or I shouldn't say we, someone, <laughs> Slater, defined a new set of functions which I'll denote with a letter capital S. Uh, I'm trying to be like uh, other sources that write these as letter S. And it'll be dependent upon these same uh, three coordinates. So maybe I should make this an actual function. It'll have a normalization constant. It'll have an r dependent part. But now instead of r raised to the l power, it's going to be r raised to the n minus 1. And then we'll have an exponential part. And we'll have the spherical harmonics, uh, theta and phi. Now, a couple of things to notice about this. OK, this has a lot more stuff than this. That's what makes these a little bit easier to use. Um, but another critical part is that we had nodes up here in the radial part, but we have no radial nodes down here. All right, There is no way you can get a node out of this particular combination of functions of R. And, uh, and so it's something that uh, you know, distinguishes these Slater orbitals. And it means that they're not going to be precisely uh, accurate for all purposes. But it turns out they've been tailored in such a way that they are actually remarkably accurate. Now, another thing I want to note here is that we've drawn this up here for the hydrogen atom. And so we've assumed that the nuclear charge is plus 1. If I had had a nuclear charge z that was not equal to 1, how would that appear in this overall equation? Well, the place it would appear is that uh, virtually everywhere where we have an r, we would have a factor of z also. So in other words, we'd have a factor of z to the l. We'd have a factor of z in these Laguerre polynomials. And we'd have a factor of z in this exponential decay, something like that. So what we're seeing down here with the Slater orbital is a way of uh, modeling that factor of z when we talk about heavier atoms that have larger charge. All right, but these parameters, which uh, this is the Greek letter zeta, um, they sort of correspond to this z over n a0. All right, but I'll tell you that they are not equal to this. All right, if they were equal to this, that would mean that uh, all of the electrons are feeling the full nuclear charge. Uh, even if they're in some outer or valence orbital. Um, what we know, though, at least intuitively, is that when we have an atom, and uh, so I'll, I'll draw a poor man's version of an atom. I've got an atom here with a, a plus z charge on the nucleus, and I've got uh, all sorts of layers of electrons. Um, 
and, and I'm drawing those layers very explicitly, but uh, we know that electrons, in fact, are spread out over all space. But I have some electrons that are very dense here near the nucleus, the 1s electron. I have another set of electrons that are not quite as dense around the nucleus, and so forth. And if I'm an electron way out here, I'm not seeing the full nuclear charge. There is a little bit of screening that occurs. And so part of what Slater was trying to accomplish with these orbitals is to take account of that screening through this parameter, uh, a zeta. And Z as Slater set up uh, some rules called Slater's rules for how one would define the screening uh, due to inner electrons in an atom that, had, that was a multi-electronic atom. So in effect, what he was doing was he was defining for the atoms, for the heavier atoms, an effective nuclear charge which he could relate to the exact nuclear charge minus some sort of screening constant. So this is the screening due to the core electrons. And this all, I think, makes some sense. And in fact, we still uh, use some of these arguments in general chemistry when we talk about what affects the size of atoms and what affects things like their ionization potential and their electron affinity. It has a lot to do with what is the effective nuclear charge felt by the electrons in the valence shell. So Slater was a pioneer in figuring all this out. His work, uh, by the way, was in around 1930, so almost 100 years ago that he came up with this. And he used his rules to tailor these particular functions as models for the hydrogen atom orbitals. And so what he could do was to use these functions in place of hydrogen orbitals as he was building up multi-electron atoms. And uh, this was actually a reasonably successful uh, approach. His uh, results, of course, because the Slater orbitals are not the same as the hydrogen uh, functions, they're not exact, and so the energy levels were not exact. Uh, but it turned out that because they have this parameter zeta, um, it certainly occurred later on to folks that you could use this zeta as though it were a variational parameter. And this is uh, what brings us a little bit closer to the modern times, not too much, but a little bit. Clementi in the 1960s uh, began to use Slater orbitals, but with zeta uh, now as a variational parameter. And so he optimized the value of zeta. And in, optimized, in optimizing these parameters data, he was able to get results that were a bit more uh, consistent, a bit more accurate. Now, just to give you an idea of what some of these uh, things might be, um, let me give you the uh, Clementi uh, optimized parameters for these zeta functions for both the 1s and the 2s and 2p. It turns out they're the same for both of these. So maybe I should, instead of writing, writing it this way, I should just write that uh, zeta of 2s is the same as zeta of 2p in the Slater orbitals. And so what they found was that for hydrogen, for example, uh, and this I think is a really curious result, they found that the effective nuclear charge uh, or this effective zeta in this part of the Slater orbitals should be 1.24, so actually a little bit more than 1. Um, that made the results turn out a little bit better. Now if I skip over some elements and go to carbon, um, what one finds is that these zeta parameters for carbon should be 5.67, and their 2s and 2p should be 1.72. So what we're seeing here is that the, uh, the I, I should mention, the larger zeta is, the smaller the radial function. What do I mean by that? Well, these functions are exponential decays. And as zeta gets larger, they get closer and closer to the y-axis. As it gets smaller, it gets broader. So large zeta means it's holding the electron really close to the nucleus. Small zeta means that it's very diffuse, that the electron is far from the nucleus. And so this is filling, this is helping us uh, accumulate some in intuition, if you will, about these orbitals and, uh, and how we can treat them mathematically. So the, the net result here is that the s orbital, the 1s orbital in carbon is very small. It's got a very large zeta parameter. Uh, the 2s and 2p is somewhat larger.
okay, which is in keeping with what we think about these orbitals. If we go to nitrogen, this goes up to 6.67, okay, we've added one proton to the nucleus, we've added one unit to the zeta, so that kind of makes sense too. It turns out though for the 2s and 2p, it doesn't go up by the same amount, so you can see that the differential change is less for these because some of these uh, the 2s and 2p electrons are screening one another and so that's why this is not such a big effect we go to oxygen it's uh, 7.66 so again we've added one to the nuclear charge for the 1s but for the 2s and 2p it's 2.25 and finally for fluorine this would be 8.56 so not quite one added there and this jumps up to 2.55. Well, these are going up by about 0.3 each time. All right, so these are the parameters now that would define the Slater orbitals for these functions. And uh, that uh, makes these then uh, very handy for use in, in a very uh, almost empirical way for heavier atoms. And in fact, the Slater orbitals have typically been used to define the uh, quantum states for heavier atoms. It turns out that for a variety of reasons that we'll talk about uh, in another video, uh, they're not as useful or they're, they're a little bit harder to use when we talk about molecules.